if you, you can imagine being in the third grade in this school with in a predominantly white environment with this book that I knew that my classmates were seeing as well that was telling a story about people like me as it was telling a story about Jefferson, namely that white people were smart, intellectually curious, uh, intelligent people who wanted to go on and find out about the world, and black people were sort of lazy and you know, silly and not interested in studies. And that was my introduction, I think, to the power of history, <coughs> the power of the writing of history, what you can accomplish as you're telling the story of the nation, even, as I said, in seemingly neutral terms. So I kept up this interest in Jefferson, even despite that, I actually, I was interested in him. I had identification with him because he liked to read and he liked to find out about the world. And I saw myself as being that type of person, even though I knew with the racial angle, I was supposed to identify with the person who was black, the person who in this author's telling of the story was someone who was not, um, you know, who was not, as I said, curious, intellectually uh, sound, or anybody who wanted to find out about the world. So, but I kept my interest in Jefferson. And when I was 12, I came upon a book written <coughs> by a man named Winthrop Jordan, who was a great historian who died not long ago, who wrote a book called White Over Black. And this is another one of the kinds of books that, that Jim talked about, a book that will live forever as, as, a, as an exploration of the history of slavery and race in the Western world and in America. And he has a chapter that's called Thomas Jefferson's Self and Society, and it talked about Jefferson's attitude about race, and it was a more mature look at the subject than the kind of thing that I've been reading in my childhood biographies about Jefferson. And he also mentioned something that I never heard of, the story that Jefferson had had a liaison, a 38-year liaison with an enslaved woman on his plantation. Now, Jordan did not take a position on that question, um, he was, he pronounced himself agnostic, but he was really the first person to look at it in sort of calm terms. Most people who had written about Jefferson's life and when they encountered this story, got pretty hysterical about it. Oh, this could never have happened. This is outrageous. This story is, you know, it's fantastical. It couldn't, it couldn't have happened. Jordan had a more balanced view, and I think it was important for me to have come upon this topic by someone, you know, reading someone who was neutral wasn't, you know, hysterical about it one way or the other. And I thought this is sort of an interesting idea that it wasn't strange to me because as I said, I grew up in Texas and slavery was a part of life in Texas. I knew about the history of, of, of slavery in Texas. The idea that a slave owner would have children with a slave woman was also not odd to me. If you go to black family reunions, the people there are all the colors of the rainbow, different colors, different hair textures. I mean, the notion of racial mixture is present for black people on a daily basis in a way that probably is not for whites. Um, just because the families that white men had with black women, those families were kept somewhere else. You didn't talk about that. That wasn't, um, um, it wasn't part of the sort of daily existence of people. So th the notion that Jefferson could have had children with a slave woman was not something that said, oh, that's crazy. You know, that is ridiculous, because I knew that of course it's possible. That kind of thing happened all the time. Um, but from there, as Jim said, I got Fawn Brody's book. Fawn Brody was a historian uh, who wrote a biography of Jefferson in 1974. And in this book, she did something that no one had ever done. She went beyond Winthrop Jordan, and she treated the story as if it were really a part of Jefferson's life. A straight biography, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then Sally Hemings, and then and he just sort of just w wove it into the story. And people went crazy, uh, ballistic. She was vilified um, for doing this, but also because she used, um, she believed in Freudian psychology, and so she was sort of psychoanalyzing Jefferson. She kind of said that out loud. Historians, in lots of ways, psychoanalyze their subjects all the time. I mean, you do it. I mean, you're, you're using your own interpretive understanding of what is making a person tick, and that's analyzing somebody. Her problem was she was upfront about it, and she said, here's what I'm doing. I'm looking at this according to the tenets of Sigmund Freud, and that set people off as well. So two things, the Freudian psychology, the psychohistory, which people ridiculed, even though, as I said, at some basic level, that's what historians do. And second, that she accepted the heaven story as factual. And so she was called romantic. That's sort of the catchword. When you deal with women writers, 
a put down is to use the term romance, right? They're romantic, sort of a play to this notion of women as irrational people who are always looking for, you know, Fabio or whatever. <laughs> Nobody looks for Fabio anymore. That's the like 1970s, but you know what I mean. Um, that kind of bodice group or romance kind of thing. That that's what they were accusing her of doing. And that's just a real put down. Look for that in, in writing about women. Romance. This is romantic. That, that's a, there's a whole history and thing behind that. But in any event, that's what they said about her. And I read the book, and I remember seeing her on, on the Today Show. And she was this is very beleaguered person. I knew people were upset with her. And so from reading her book, I found out the other historians who were sort of in opposition to her. And I began to read them, Duma Malone and Meryl Peterson, the sort of standard biographers of Jefferson. And from that, I kept this interest in this topic because it wasn't just about whether Tom and Sally had an affair. It really was, to me, about the way black people are portrayed in history. And when I wrote my first book, that Jim talked about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings in American Controversy, what I set out to do was to go back over all of the writings about this particular topic <coughs> and to show how I thought American historians had given short shrift to the Hemings family story because members of the Hemings family claim Jefferson as, as, a, as an ancestor. And Jefferson's legal family said, no, 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 this was not true. So you had two stories that you could compare, this is what you do in law school. As a law professor, um, you, we look at cases, and usually with cases there are two sides, or sometimes more, but numerous sides, and what you do is you walk through with your students to see how people are presenting their story, to see what information exists to support what they're saying, and so it was a perfect, even though it's a historical topic, it was a perfect thing for a law professor, I think, to look at. Because this is what we do with our students. Make people support their claims. Make people um, uh, justify what it is they're saying. And from that, I determined that it was very likely that this story was true, that the story the Jefferson family had told about why uh, Jefferson, Sally Hemings' children looked just like Jefferson. They said the reason they looked just like him is because they're the children of his nephews. And that's why they look like it, which is possible. It's not a crazy story, but that's, you know, it's possible. And so I went through and looked at it and said, why are you believing what these people are saying when I can show you that many times in the course of their uh, story, they're, they're saying things are untrue. And on the other hand, these people have a lot to support them. So that's what I said. And after my book came out, uh, a year later, someone announced that they were going to be doing DNA testing. So this is an interesting thing. You know, it's one thing when you're a historian to sort of say, yeah, you know, these people are telling the truth and these people are not. Now there's going to be a scientific test <laughs> as to whether or not they're telling the truth. So I kind of sat there for like an hour, not an hour, like for a year, thinking, my gosh, you know, it's like having a, uh, it's like the jury being out and you're waiting for the answer to this. And we got the answer a year later when the testing came back and showed that the people who were supposed to be the Hemingses' um, progenitors, according to the Jefferson family, were not connected to the Jeffersons at all. There was a connection between the Hemings and the Jefferson descendant, uh, not a strict paternity test, but ruling out the people who had been put up as the people who were the fathers and saying that there was a connection between the Jefferson and the Hemingses. And so that's when I sort of breathed a sigh of relief. And, um, my career as a historian took out even more because it's very rare that you actually have any kind of, of science weighing in on history. The only other time I could think of was with, with Marie Antoinette of the Dauphin, at their child who was put in the Bastille after the, uh, the king and queen were killed. The question was whether or not he was actually their son, or whether there were, there were all these people running around Europe pretending to be uh, you know, their son. But they actually had um, tissue from his heart left, and they tested that against other descendants in that family and determined that he was, in fact, their son. And the only other thing I could think of was there was a woman who was pretending to be Anastasia, the long-lost princess of the Romanovs. Uh, she lived in Charlottesville, of all places, um, and she was not. They actually found, <laughs> surprise, surprise, um, she, uh, they actually found uh, Anastasia where their family was buried, not very far from where the, the Tsar and his wife were executed, as a matter of fact. So this, this is a rare thing for science to weigh in. Science weighed in on this, and then I decided 
uh, that I wanted to do something else. It wasn't just enough to talk about how historians had, you know, I thought, misused or, or sort of ignored evidence. I wanted to talk about the Hemings family, and that's what the Hemings of Monticello is about. One of the things that I noticed in people, you know, sort of debunking this story, they say, well, Jefferson would never be involved with a slave girl or there's no evidence that this ever happened. And, you know, a slave girl, what is a slave girl? Uh, Sally Hemings was a person, she was an individual. There were thousands and thousands, there were millions of women who were enslaved. They were not one thing. And to say a slave girl sort of took away all of her individuality. To say that it never happened, um, as, I, as I was mentioning before, sort of, I thought, played short shrift or sort of, in, in a way, dismissed the stories of enslaved people. I mean, if you think about it, in slavery, I mean, who are you gonna, if, if you can't listen to the people who are the objects of that institution, the people, you know, what is going on? You're gonna listen to the people who are enslaving them and say, well, here's what we did and didn't do. No, you listen to the people who are the victims of the system. And you don't have to believe every single thing they say, but you don't give them the back of your hand either. And I thought, well, one of the reasons people can do this so easily <coughs> is that people don't know anything about the Hemings family. I think it's easy to dismiss people when you don't know them. In my community, and we know how it is in Manhattan, you know, there are millions of people wandering around, but it's this thing, whenever I'm introduced to somebody in my community, then I find, I see them all the time. <laughs> you know, I mean, I've been probably walking past them for years, but the moment you're introduced to them, then, you know, you're going to wait and read, oh, well, there's, you know, Mrs. Jones. There's, so, when you have a connection to someone, you pay attention. So what I wanted to do in this book, the last latest book, was to tell the story of the Hemingses individually, to give the readers a stake in people, so that when people said, you know, a slave girl, a slave boy, whatever, an enslaved person, that you understood that there were human beings who lived in that system, and they were all different personalities. There is many different types of enslaved people, or as there were people who were free. I think it carries over to black and white, Today, I think blacks are seen monolithically. There are as many different types of black people as there are white people. There are funny black people. There are not funny black people. There are white people who are, you know, who are shy and some who are bold. Every single thing, but you don't see that. If you watch popular culture, blacks are essentially, you know, two or three things. You know what they're going to do. My son says, you know, you go to a movie, you know what the black person is going to do. You know how they're going to respond. White people are stereotype too, but the range of personalities is, I think, is much wider than you have for blacks who come in and play stereotypical roles. So what I wanted to do in The Heavens of Monticello is to remind people that slavery was a system that blighted all of people's lives, but there were individual people who went through the institution. James Hemings, Sally Hemings, Robert Hemings, lots of members of the family who were very different. I can tell from the information that I was able to gather about them, different personalities, different experiences. And that, I think, makes slavery even that much more, I mean, you know it's a horrible institution, but even much more so when you can see that these, we reminded that these were people who were living under that system. And so the whole of my work has been towards broadening people's understanding of the institution and broadening people's understanding of the people who lived in that institution. Because this is stuff that we're still living with today. I mean, this is not long ago. Uh, my great-grandmother's mother was born as, as a slave. She was a slave as a little girl. So I knew somebody, you know, who knew somebody who was a slave. This is not, I mean, American history is very, very, we have a, we're a young country. And so all of this stuff is still with us. And I really, really think that we can't understand where we are today until we get a better sense of what that time was like. And so that's what I was able to do you know, from a childhood entrance to turn that into something that has become my profession and something that I've been very, very privileged to do. It's a great, very fortunate, great privilege to be able to do something in your life that you really, really like. I mean, there are a lot of jobs that you can have that you work at and pay the bills, but I'm very, very fortunate to be able to do something that I love and something that I think I was born to do, and it's always a great privilege, so that's why I'm happy to be able to talk to you. Uh, I would like to take...